Greetings, this is Zahir Nali from the Solve ME CFS Initiative. Welcome to our webinar series. We have a special treat today. We have Dr. Maureen Hansen from Cornell University who will be educating us on the many development in ME CFS research. Uh, we do not have enough time to list all the qualifications of Dr. Hansen, but briefly, Maureen Hansen is the Liberty Hyde Bailey Professor in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics at Cornell. She received her bachelor's degree from Duke University and a PhD in Cell and Developmental Biology from Harvard University. After completing an NIH postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard, she joined the faculty of the Biology Department at the University of Virginia. She then moved to Cornell as associate professor and became a full professor in 1991. She's presently a member of the graduate fields of genetics and development, plant biology and biochemistry, molecular and cellular biology. She has previously served as an associate director of the Cornell Biotechnology Program and director of the Cornell Plant Science Center. Dr. Hansen's work on MECFS is truly exciting and you'll see and, and hear that right now. Uh, so we are thrilled to have you, Dr. Hansen. I took a peek at the slides. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I will be describing some current as well as previous research on MECFS that's been done at Cornell University. Uh, my lab website has some more information that you may want to consult. It's going to be updated further very soon. So I'm going to address four major questions. And my talk, talk is really divided into four sections. Each of these sections is somewhat independent, so that if you get uh, bored in one of the sections, uh, you can uh, listen to the subsequent ones without having to know what I said in the previous ones. So there's really four independent parts to my talk. I'm first going to talk about mitochondrial genetic variation. Uh, then I want to talk about white blood cells and their possible differences between patients and healthy individuals. I will also discuss how metabolism might be affected in MECFS, and then discuss gastrointestinal function in MECFS. So to start, I want to uh, put out a genetic hypothesis regarding MECFS. And that hypothesis is that it's possible that the diversity of symptoms that we see in MECFS patients may be due to genetic differences in the victims of the disease who have been exposed to a single or to perhaps different inciting factors. MECFS is often referred to as a diverse disease. I would like to say that that doesn't mean uh, that there's really no evidence that there it's, it's many diseases. It's still possible there's a single disease, a uh, single fundamental disruption, and it's also possible still, despite uh, reports of getting sick after many different possible uh, illnesses, it's also possible that there's a single factor that is causing the disease that we don't really understand yet, especially since diversity in symptoms could potentially be caused by genetic differences. So that's something that we wanted to investigate. Now, we have published um, uh, this year, we published a paper about mitochondrial DNA variation. And it's that paper that I'm going to start with to discuss. This work was funded largely by the Hutchins Family Foundation, the Chronic Fatigue Initiative. It also received some support from Cornell University internal funds. And one of our participants, one of the students, the lead author, actually had some support from NSF uh, for a, a graduate fellowship. This work was done not only in my lab, but also in the labs of Alan Kynan in computational biology at Cornell and Zheng Long Gu, who's in nutritional sciences at Cornell. So the first question we asked is whether some patients with MECFS who are identified by expert MDs might actually have a genetic mitochondrial disease. 
is it possible some of these people didn't really have ME-CFS, but they had a uh, problem with their uh, mitochondrial genomes, some uh, mutant uh, mitochondrial genes that were causing the disease. We analyzed 193 cases and 196 controls from samples that we received from the Chronic Fatigue Initiative. These were age and gender matched. And the patients were identified by all of these uh, expert physicians that many of you know. Uh, the list is there for you to see. They collected the blood and provided the blood to uh, the central repository at Columbia and uh, then uh, this was then archived at uh, Duke in a, in a biobank. So that is the blood that we used. And we analyzed the blood to see if we could find in the mitochondrial uh, genomes any uh, abnormal mutant genes. And we actually did not find in any of the patients any mutations that would lead to a known genetic mitochondrial disease. So the answer to this is no. These doctors have identified 193 MECFS cases that are not uh, mistaken for mitochondrial disease. So one further thing that we needed to analyze was other variation that might occur in, in individuals in, with MECFS. So mitochondrial genomes often differ between normal people. Of course, most MECFS uh, patients were healthy at one time, and normal people uh, do have variation in their mitochondrial genome. They have what are so called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphism. This is a single change in the DNA code. So you see there this purple person has got a nucleotide A at a particular part of their DNA, while the blue person has a G and the orange person has a T. Those are single nucleotide polymorphisms. They can sometimes be harmful, but in many cases there's no known association of some SNPs that exist in mitochondrial geno genomes with any sort of disease or condition. So we asked the question whether this mitochondrial genome variation that's not known to be harmful could be correlated with whether you get MECFS or not. Is it correlated with your chances of becoming ill? And we could find no correlation of this mitochondrial genome variation with susceptibility. We then went on to ask, is mitochondrial genome variation correlated with particular symptoms or their severity in the patients? And there we got some more interesting information, and that is that there seems to be some correlation. The answer is yes. So as I mentioned, SNPs on human mitochondrial genomes are sometimes known to be harmful, try causing true mitochondrial disease, but we didn't see any of those in the patient population. But we did see some other SNPs. This is a diagram of the mitochondrial genome. And the little numbers that you see there are lists of these SNPs that exist in various populations around the world. Some of these are harmful, are known to be harmful, but others are not. And the SNPs that we looked at, 7, 19, 30, 10, and then the ones up here in those regions, those three there and two there, those turned out to be somewhat interesting with regard to MECFS. We looked at 270 different symptom scores that were collected from patient questionnaires. And this was an important aspect of the work done by the physicians in this, for the Chronic Fatigue Initiative. They collected a lot of information from the patients. It was also a lot of work for the patients to do those questionnaires, so we're very grateful that they were willing to fill out those forms. Because that allowed us to identify eight mitochondrial DNA SNPs out of uh, 70 total that were associated with 16 symptom categories. Now, I'm not going to go through all of those uh, 16 categories, but I'm going to give you just two examples from two of the SNPs. So, oops. So the, um, the 719 allele, with 17, 719A, in other words, an A present at position 719 in the nucleotides of the mitochondrial genome is shown on the left. There's two graphs on the left. Let's look at those. If you have an A, a nucleotide A at 719, you're more likely to have neuroinflammatory distress, according to this analysis. While if you have a G, you have less. 
Now those little boxes are so-called box plots. The line across shows the median value, and the box plot gives you an idea of the range of the uh, reported symptoms. And at the bottom, you can see chemical sensitivity was also reported to be higher in the people who had an A versus the people who had a G at that particular location. Now, likewise, for the SNP 16519, the people who had that had a C at that position reported more gastrointestinal distress than the people who had a T. And they also reported more severe bloating if they had a C versus a T. So to conclude this first section about mitochondrial genetic variation, we can say that in this particular cohort, we found certain mitochondrial DNA SNPs that were correlated with symptom type and severity. This then is consistent with this hypothesis that some of the symptom variation could be due to genetic background rather than being due to a difference in the fundamental disruption that's present in the patients or a, a diversity in the causes of CFS. So we also have several, several caveats, though, on this study. One is that we really need to analyze mitochondrial DNAs in a larger cohort to verify this and also further probe the mitochondrial DNA variation connection. It's possible that other variants are present that could be correlated. Most population genetic study don't use merely hundreds of patients and controls. They use thousands. So uh, at some future date, I would hope that a large, much larger cohort of patients could be and controls could be analyzed with respect to population genetics. Now, I would also like to mention that mitochondrial function is also controlled by nuclear genes. We only examined the mitochondrial genes, a much smaller set. It uh, would be important to look at genetic variation in nuclear genes that encode mitochondrial proteins. This could also be informative. So next, I'd like to turn to uh, my next topic, which is the question of abnormalities in white blood cells in MECFS. There have been many studies over many years indicating that there's something going on in white blood cells in this disease that is, is abnormal. One of the first findings was that natural killer cells don't have the normal activity. They're they have less activity than uh, controls. Um, that, that finding has been repeated in several groups. It's one of the most reproducible findings. Uh, it's one of these papers is actually from 1994, so this has been known for a very long time. Uh, recently, you probably remember there is an important paper showing differences in cytokines in patients and that there was a difference between uh, people with short versus long duration of illness. There are a number of studies showing different subsets of uh, white blood cells, different abundances. And uh, this, this evidence really is extremely strong that there's uh, something wrong in white blood cells. And one indirect uh, evidence is the very important rituximab studies, which indicate that if you deplete uh, B cells, that a subset of patients uh, improve, uh, and that is also indicating there's something uh, going on with white blood cells that we'd like to learn more about. So I'd like to uh, just review briefly the types of white blood cells. Uh, this diagram here shows the variety of types of white blood cells. The ones that most studies have dealt with are B cells, the antibody producing cells, T cells, and these natural killer cells. And those are the ones that I'm going to concentrate my talk on. There have been some other interesting studies on some of these other cell types, but I'll stick with B, T, and NK cells uh, for this talk. So I'd like to introduce a project that's still in progress, and I'm not going to present any results, but I thought it would be interesting for people to know about this project. This project has been funded by NIH. It's been going on for several years. Uh, uh, there's a lot of sample collection that had to be done. Uh, our collaborating physician on this project is Susan Levine in Manhattan. And as some of you know, Weill Cornell Medical College is also in Manhattan. 
So she collected samples from patients, and blood samples, and those samples were then sent to Weill Cornell Medical College. Actually, they were hand carried to Weill Cornell Medical College and given to Rita Shaknovich, who then separated the white blood cells on an automated cell sorter. Uh, there's a diagram there of a picture of an automated cell sorter like the one that she used to separate the cells into B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. Now this project is being led by Fabian Campagna, a bioinformaticist who is located at Weill Cornell Medical College. He is the PI and I'm one of his collaborators. So uh, these B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells were then extracted for their RNA and then uh, the RNA converted into DNA for sequencing on this automated sequencer at the Cornell Sequencing Facility. So we're at the point right now of doing analyses to find out if there are differences in gene expression between MECFS patients and healthy individuals. And this kind of information may reveal why there are these differences in function in BT and NK cells that are implicated by those other studies. We also are carrying out another uh, study using BT and NK cells. This is a study of mitochondrial function in BT and NK cells. This project is also in progress. This is funded by, also by NIH. It's a two-year smaller grant, uh, essentially a pilot project to investigate uh, new ideas for uh, problems that might be existing in this uh, disease. And I'm the PI on this one. Uh, my collaborators are David Rupert, an expert statistician, and Avery August, who is an expert in T cells and their function. Susan Levine again provided the samples for this study. So we are again taking B cells, T cells, and NK cells. We're separating those in Ithaca in my lab and then analyzing them with this device shown at the bottom left which is a, a device that can uh, analyze uh, cell metabolism. Uh, it's sold by Agilent Company. And it allows you to measure the, uh, the glyco glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, which are two energy transducing pathways in cells. Uh, you can get quantitative assays of the function of these two systems. But what we would like to find out is whether the um, B cells, T cells, and NK cells are having some difficulties with these uh, uh, energy transducing pathways or perhaps they're utilizing more of one than the other than normal people cells do. So we're looking at both ratios and, and how active these pathways are uh, in these uh, patients' uh, isolated white blood cells. So this project again is in progress. So that uh, completes that section of my talk, and I'd now like to turn to the question of metabolism and how metabolism differs in MECFS cases versus controls. Of course, the prior uh, work that I just described, the project, also is studying metabolism. But in this section of my talk, I wanted to talk about meta metabolomics, uh, at looking at the molecules that are present in uh, humans, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of looking at mitochondrial function directly, we're looking at it indirectly by looking at metabolites that uh, may uh, be affected in, uh, in MECFS. So I think uh, many of you have probably heard uh, or read this paper that just came out a few days ago. Uh, from a group at UC San Diego, published in PNAS, in which they looked at 612 metabolites present in uh, plasma of uh, MECFS patients. They had 40 males and 44 females with or without uh, MECFS. And at, at a significance of Q less than 0.10, they found 28 metabolites that were different in the males and 25 in the females. But, and what was interesting is that 86% of the metabolites that were different were actually decreased in amount in the males and 84% decreased in the females. 
They also detected some differences between males and females as to what metabolites were different. The differences in the males are shown in the lower left. The differences on the females in the lower right. But there were some pathways that were common between males and females. Now, it's not important for me to go through the details of what these uh, metabolites do, because my real point is to compare this work with some work that we've been doing here at Cornell. So we uh, have been doing a pilot study on uh, plasma metabolites as well. And we actually have submitted a paper. This is under review at a journal right now. The title of our paper indicates that we also found some interesting differences between MECFS patients and controls. We saw disturbances in fatty acid and lipid metabolism. Now, I uh, led this project. Susan Levine, again, provided the samples. David Rupert provided the statistical analysis. And the work in my lab was done by a postdoc named Arnaud Germain. We uh, also had the uh, chance to do mass spectrometry in the lab of Jason Locasal. This is a, uh, an illustration of the equipment that's used. This is a mass spectrometer. Because we uh, uh, have actually no funding from any external research uh, agency or foundation for this study, this is totally funded by some small donations to, to our research program from individual patients as well as Cornell University. Uh, this is a very small, necessarily a very small study. We were only able to look at 17 patients and 15 controls, and because we could only look at a small number, we selected all female patients for this study. We also only saw 361 metabolites rather than the, the somewhat larger number uh, of the UC San Diego study. But what's interesting is some similarities between our results and their findings. So we also found that most of the significantly different metabolites were lower in the MECFS patients than in the controls. So on the y-axis is the amount of the various metabolites that we were detecting. Uh, the controls are shown in red and the patients in green or blue. Uh, and uh, the, um, again, we have those rectangular shapes that indicate the range of the amounts of metabolites that we saw in those, of those particular metabolites. So we, this shows 33 different metabolites, all which had significant, statistically significant differences between patients and controls. That horizontal bar in the middle shows the median amount of the metabolite detected in the patients or in the controls. And as you can see, if you look on the left, from left to right, Almost all of the metabolites, except for the last four, the patients were lo lower than the controls. There were four metabolites that the patients actually had more of than the controls, but most of them had uh, less. So let's compare our results to that, uh, those reported in the PNAS paper. Uh, so first of all, we had fewer metabolites because we used a very uh, different method for handling the blood, for analyzing the blood. We both, both groups use mass spectrometry, but there are different ways to, to do mass spectrometry. And we, our way, uh, we had in, in this pilot study, we had 361 uh, metabolites instead of 612. We also only did females, uh, and our cohort size of females was smaller than theirs. They had more samples. Interestingly enough, uh, we had about the same number of metabolites that we found to be significantly different. They had 37 that were different at, at a Q value of 0.15, and we had 33. What's most fascinating is that they found 84% that were decreased, while we found 88% decreased. And this also means that we, like uh, the US, uh, UC San Diego group, found that the patients appear to have a hypometabolic state. Not only that, another interesting uh, aspect of our study is that we also found some of the same affected pathways. So in common, for example, we found phospholipids and purines and some amino acids, fatty acid oxidation, bile acids and amino sugars to be affected in our study, uh, and these were affected in the PNAS study. 
On the left, though, there are some things they detected that we did not that had some significant differences. And on the right, we also saw some differences that they did not see. And this could certainly be a result of our using different methods for doing the mass spectrometry, for handling the blood. We have a diff completely different cohort uh, of patients than they do. And um, so, but nevertheless, these similarities are very promising for metabolomics to really be giving some extremely useful information about MECFS. So we hope to pursue this further. We currently do not have additional funding to pursue this. Uh, we have submitted a proposal to NIH to con continue to do metabolomic analysis, but it'll be some time before we know whether or not that funding will be available. So I'd now like to turn to my last topic, and that is the topic that many of you already know about. It's our work in, on the gut microbiome in MECFS. Uh, this uh, was published in June in the journal Microbiome. Uh, this work was a collaboration between Ruth Lay's lab uh, uh, in, uh, in my department, uh, and the two people in her lab that worked with us were Julia Goodrich and Tony Walters. Again, Susan Levine provided the samples uh, from her uh, patients in some controls. And uh, Ludovic Gilato uh, was the uh, lead author. He is a postdoctoral associate in, in my lab. This work was funded, again, by a two-year NIH grant that has now expired. Uh, again, it was a grant, uh, an R so-called R21 grant that's used to explore uh, new uh, ideas uh, in, uh, in research uh, relevant to NIH. So our study population were established patients of uh, Susan Levine. Uh, she, she, per, she was able to persuade uh, 39 controls, uh, 30 female, 9 male, 30, 38 female patients, and 11 male patients to provide us with samples. We received both blood samples and fecal samples from these individuals. Of these patients, uh, 25 of them reported a sudden onset of MECFS. In age, the median age was fairly close between the controls and the patients, although there was quite a variation as far as the age uh, between the two. And um, uh, the body mass index was quite normal, although again, there was quite a variation from underweight to overweight. Of the controls, eight of the 39 controls reported some sort of intestinal discomfort, such as uh, constipation or diarrhea or stomach ache occasionally. Of the patients, however, 32 of the 47 actually reported that they had some, in, some sort of intestinal discomfort. So let's review the human microbiota briefly. Uh, in and on humans, there are as many microbial cells as human cells. So it's been, that's sparked, that knowledge sparked the interest in the microbiome that uh, has uh, existed uh, in the last few years, along with some new technology that allows this, the type of microbial cells really to be analyzed quite thoroughly. The majority of these microbial cells are in the large intestine. And they, it is known that they provide enhanced nutrition and protection against pathogens. So many MECFS patients complain of gastrointestinal symptoms. So that leads to the question, is abnormal gastrointestinal function causing some inf inflammation that then could be causing some of the sickness symptoms that MECFS patients feel? Also, also does the bacterial gut microbiome of MECFS patients differ from that in healthy controls? Those are the questions that we asked. So to explain what we did, I need to point out that some bacteria have lipopolysaccharides, abbreviated as LPS, on their surfaces. On the left, you will see a diagram of a bacterium, a so-called gram-negative bacterium. And on its uh, outer surface, it has these so-called lipopolysaccharides. 
uh, that um, extend out and um, uh, can be examined by uh, uh, various assays. So uh, on the right is a diagram of a dysfunctional gut. So if you have some problems with your um, uh, uh, gut, uh, the, the cells, for example, might allow passage of bacteria from inside the digestive tract to the outside, and this can get into your bloodstream then. And if the, if the bacteria get into your bloodstream, then the LPS is in there, and you uh, then have LPS in your, in your uh, blood, which then can set off sort of alarm signals to the body that bacteria have invaded and the body will take measures to deal with that. So we looked to see whether LPS and also LPS-related proteins are elevated in MECFS cases versus controls. So on the left, you see the amount of LPS present in controls versus MECFS patients. Now each of those dots, on the left a red dot and on the right a blue dot for the patients, and that's the actual measurement that we got of LPS. So that you can see there's quite a range. Uh, there are some patients who have the same amount of LPS as, con as the controls. And, uh, but uh, if you look at the median, you will see the line there shows the median. Uh, the median indicates that, in general, the LPS is higher in the MECFS patients than the controls. We also looked, if you look at the far right graph, we looked at a protein called LBP for LPS binding protein. This is a protein in the blood that binds to LPS. And that is also raised in MECFS. And it's significantly different. Uh, the, again, you can see the median line of the level of LBP in the patients and controls. And then in the middle, there is a receptor in our bodies that detects this LPS bound to LBP. That lets the body know that, that there are potentially bacteria around. And again, it's increased in MECFS uh, versus the controls. So that's showing something different between patients and controls. This implies, this data implies, the fact that there's extra LPS and significantly higher levels of these other two, of these two proteins indicates that there's ongoing damage to the gut, and this is likely then causing this increased microbial translocation in the MECFS patients. This observation has been seen in other diseases, so other diseases also have elevated LPS. Uh, there's fatty liver disease, it happens in HIV infection, and uh, two types of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So how did we analyze the gut bacterial microbiomes? Well, uh, the patients themselves actually collected fecal samples. They put them in a preservative and then shipped the samples uh, to Cornell where they were processed. They were processed uh, for DNA extraction. And then some, uh, the DNA was then uh, further processed for sequencing on a so-called MySeq sequencer, uh, automated sequencer that can give you as many as 140,000 sequences per sample. So this sequencing data was obtained and then analyzed. So this DNA sequencing, uh, by looking at the actual sequence of the ribosomal DNA, of a portion of the ribosomal DNA in the bacteria, you can identify the family and sometimes the genus and species of the bacteria that is present. So this happens to be the fox family. And uh, you know that foxes uh, are animals. They are, belong to the class mammal. They're a carnivore. They're a member of the dog family. And then as far as the genus, as far as the genus goes, uh, here's an example of t uh, a gene, two different species within the genus of fox. There's an Australian fox and a British fox. The, uh, th these two species are different, but they're, they're you know, they're in this, in this genus. And then, of course, each one of these, the British fox, for example, is an example of a species. The reason I'm showing this is to indicate that while we can identify the family and sometimes the genus and sometimes the species, if we've only identified the genus of, of bacteria, 
we could have two, bac two bacterial types in the gut that are as different from one another as that Australian fox and the British fox, so that, so that we can have very different bacteria, even though we think they're, we know that they're in the same genus, they can still be quite different in their function. One might be, for example, in the same genus of bacteria, you can have a pathogenic bacteria and you can have normal uh, healthy type bacteria. So the other issue that I should mention is that different species can't always be identified by sequencing. We have to group, if, this, if two bacteria have 97% identical sequences, we say they're the same species, but we don't actually know, the same group, but we don't actually know that they're I, the same species. So what we found is as we kept, as you look at more and more sequences per sample, we could find that the MECFS patients had fewer species in their gut microbiome than the controls. So as you get out to 30,000 sequences on the right, the, the uh, controls had more different types of, of species and gene, genera and family members than the MECFS patients. This means we have a loss of species richness in MECFS microbiomes. We also found that 24 families in genera were differentially abundant between MECFS and healthy individuals, and this is statistically significant. So I'm going to put a red triangle here. These are these are all these. Hmm, I'm having trouble here. Uh, these are all the species with. These are all the species that have a lower amounts in patients than in the controls. So this is, again, an indication of the reduced diversity in the patients uh, versus the controls. Among those species that are reduced, we see that the members of the ruminococcaceae are significantly higher in healthy individuals than in the patients. And the reason this could be important is that this is a beneficial type of bacteria. It produces an anti-inflammatory protein and butyrate, which is an anti-inflammatory fatty acid. So this, this, the, this uh, abnormality is also seen in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So we attempted to use this information to see whether we could identify and distinguish between patients and controls. And we actually were able to see that we could just identify patients pretty well if in this particular cohort, 55% of the cohort were patients, and we were able to identify 53% of the cohort as patients. So that's actually quite high. It's over 90%. Unfortunately, however, though, we also identified a number of normal, 12% of the normal people were classified as MECFS. Nevertheless, we were able to identify 30% as being normal. So this gives a total value of 83% correct classification by microbiome in combination with the levels of those three uh, molecules in the blood. So I'd like to mention that there are limitations of bacterial microbiome analysis. We can't really tell whether strain is differentially present. For example, you need to use other methods to determine whether you have a bad E. coli or an ordinary E. coli. Uh, these bacterial studies don't reveal what eukaryotic pathogens might be present, and also it doesn't indicate whether viruses are present in one and not in the other. Other types of analyses are needed for that. So to conclude, we have less bacterial diversity. We have association of the abundance of specific groups with patient or healthy status. We can classify 83% of the samples correctly. And we see that anti-inflammatory species are reduced in patients. I now like to briefly describe a case report uh, that it was, uh, co uh, was led by Betsy Keller, who is an exercise physiologist at Ithaca College. Uh, she had a pair of identical twins come to her. One of them had MECFS and one of them did not. These were male twins, age 34. And the ill twin had been sick for four years with MECFS. She performed two successive cardiopulmonary exercise tests on these individuals. She found that the ill twin on the first day had a lower maximum VO2 than the well twin. 
And I'm not going to go into what that means, except to say that that does mean that the ill twin is less physically fit, as you might expect for someone who's been sick for a few years. But what was more interesting is that on the second exercise, the ill twin reached anaerobic, the, the necessity to use anaerobic metabolism at 13% lower than he did in the first exercise. So that abnormality, that, that reduction in uh, the anaerobic threshold indicates exertion intolerance in the ill twin. And um, this is a, a significant result because ill people can usually re repeat these results. For example, someone with multiple sclerosis who took these two tests would be highly likely to be able to repeat their results from the first to the second. They would not have had this decrease in anaerobic threshold. So we decided to look at the gut microbiome in these individuals. And again, just like the whole cohort that we looked at, the ill twin had reduced gut microbiome diversity and also exhibited changes like the larger study in the relative amounts of different types of bacteria. So each of the color there shows a particular bacterial family, and the ill twin clearly has a different composition than the well twin. So this uh, is interesting because in this case, the genetics of the two individuals being tested are identical, but yet because one of them has MECFS and the other as well, there are differences seen in the gut microbiome. So what attempts are being made to alter microbiomes in various diseases. In various diseases, people are trying to use diet, pre and probiotics, and antibiotics, and fecal transplants. And a number of people have written to me asking whether one of these interventions might work in MECFS. And the fact is that I don't know, because we need more studies to find out whether these uh, interventions could be useful. The one I would like to mention, however, that they're not necessarily completely innocuous to try these interventions. And, I, and then on this slide, I'm putting up just one example of a review article which examined the effect on inflammatory bowel disease, in this case Crohn's disease, uh, a table about Crohn's disease, which as I mentioned earlier, has some similarities in its gut disruption to what's seen in MECFS. A number of different interventions, a number of different pre or probiotics were used, and in, in some cases these were beneficial, but note that in some cases they actually did harm to the patients. So we can't just automatically assume that prebiotics or probiotics are always going to be beneficial, and that's why we definitely need more studies uh, to find out what might be beneficial to alter the gut microbiome in MECFS. We now have abundant evidence for biological disruption in MECFS. We have aberrant function of white blood cells, abnormal physiological responses to exercise, abnormal gut microbiota, altered metabolism, and something I haven't talked about, uh, that there are anomalous images from brain scans. That is actually some work going on at Cornell Medical School as well as, as well as a number of other locations that reveal abnormalities when you use MRI uh, or PET and other uh, types of scanning. So that's why it's unfortunate that inappropriate images of MECFS have given a distorted perception to the public of this disease not being as serious as it is. I'm just showing you six of the images that accompany the many dozens of articles about our microbiome study across the uh, country and, and the world. These are actual illustrations that you, is unfortunately often used, this type of illustration is often used because of the idea that we have a, a chronic fatigue rather than an actual disease. And I would like to suggest that it be very important for the patient organizations to be able to pro provide appropriate images to editors who uh, need illustrations of what uh, chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis uh, is in one of their articles. 
Finally, I'd like to say that you can get additional information about our microbiome study because I gave a, a longer talk about that at uh, this um, Invest in ME meeting, and there's a DVD that you can order. I also will be doing another webinar next week on September 8 at a virtual conference on microbiology and immunology. This conference is uh, aimed at uh, researchers and MDs. In fact, MDs can get CME credit for attending this conference. So it's going to be uh, in much more depth and detail than what I was able to describe either here or at the Invest in ME meeting. I'd also like to mention that we will be people from my lab and myself will also be talking at the IACFS meeting in Fort Lauderdale. And finally, I'd like to announce uh, for the first time that uh, our Vice Provost for Research has authorized the formation of a center for MECFS. We're going to call this cent center the Center for Enervating Neuroimmune Disease. This name was actually suggested by a patient, given that it's uh, very confusing what to refer uh, the, to use as a name for such a center given we've got ME, CFS, and SEID, as well as other names that various people have suggested. So we're going to call our center the Center for Enervating Neuroimmune Disease. This center will include people from both Ithaca and Weill Cornell Medical College. And at the moment, we have actually three researchers, three laboratories that, at uh, Weill Cornell that are studying ME, CFS. We have eight researchers, eight labs at uh, Cornell and Ithaca, who either have or have applied for grants for MECFS research, and we have one at Ithaca College, and we have five collaborating physicians who are working with these groups. So we would like to in actually increase the number of people at Cornell who are working on MECFS, and we think that by having the center, we should be able to attract even more interest and in increase the researchers who are working on this very important disease. And I will then I, let me see. Okay. I guess that's okay. Okay, so that's my last uh, that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, this is this is fascinating. I do not know where to start. Uh, you took us on a tour from genetics to mitochondrial biology to immunity and inflammation to metabolomics uh, as well as ex exercise physiology and I, I really thank you for m mentioning I think for the first time here a scoop on this center for enervating neuroimmune uh, disease and, and, and all the best of luck uh, with that we are certainly very supportive. So let me um, go to some questions we received so many uh, and I appreciate you working with us outside uh, to answer them as well. Uh, many of the questions, Maureen, were on uh, what type of bacterial strains one can use to um, improve uh, the, the gut flora. You actually mentioned uh, in a slide uh, and showed data uh, and qualified very much the the danger and perhaps the, the utility sometimes, but the danger of uh, of of, of uh, just uh, probiotics without a better understanding. So, do you care to comment on this further? We have um, maybe ten questions on this, so that's the gist of them. Okay, I, I will comment briefly, uh, just also with a caveat. I am not an MD; I'm a PhD, but I will say that. Um, among the uh, bacteria that were lower in the uh, MECFS uh, patients is one that is used in probiotics. It's called bifidobacterium. Mm -hmm. uh, so that one is lower. Whether or not that would help, taking that would help uh, or not is not clear because after all these changes in the gut microbiome that we're seeing could actually be the result of some other problem. They may not be the cause themselves, uh, but I know that a lot of people would like to treat the symptom, and if you can treat a symptom in a disease, even if you can't uh, treat the entire disease, it can sometimes be beneficial. So I don't know if taking that is going to help. Uh, I, 
there haven't been adequate studies to find out if it would help. But that is one yeah. that is available. I would also like to say that many of the uh, number of people have asked about this. Uh, I've gotten, I have I have to say I've gotten a lot of emails and I haven't been able to keep up with them. I've been able to answer a few. Um, so uh, I apologize to those people who I've not been able to respond to. But many of those missing bacteria cannot be taken as probiotics because they can't be cultured. We don't know how to grow them. And that's one reason that people have fecal transplants for certain diseases is because you can't replace by merely taking uh, uh, an oral uh, probiotic. You can't replace those and that's why people have to have fecal transplant. But although there have been some anecdotal evidence and case reports about fecal transplants and MECFS, again there's not enough information to know how helpful that will be to most people or not. Great, thank you. And it, it's, it's of note that maybe one trillion microbes uh, are existing in our guts. Actually, this is a humongous number, so, so just to put things in perspective. Um, now, let me give you this one on, on uh, genetics question. Can SNPs issues be treated? I think that's a very hard one to me. But can single nucleotide polymorphisms issues be treated? Well, there is a, a very large effort uh, in the mitochondrial disease community to find ways to ameliorate these mitochondrial genetic, you know, mitochondrial diseases. And there are actually some uh, drugs and some uh, molecules and, uh, that one can take that, that help these people who have the, the actual genetic mitochondrial diseases. Uh, those are often very de devastating diseases with a very poor prognosis, uh, but there have there have actually been some uh, some treatments. Uh, whether whether um, one would be able to do anything about uh, the variation we found, it's it's really quite premature because, as I mentioned, we really need to do a larger population. And even though, again, we found a correlation with symptom severity or types of symptoms, there are plenty of people in our cohort who, who don't have those SNPs and that you know, they still have those symptoms. So, so I, I doubt that treating those polymorphisms is going to have much effect. Yes, and, and uh, Maureen, do you think uh, this CRISPR technology, the new gene editing technology, can, can come to play here uh, with, with these type of correction, genetic corrections for SNPs? Well, um, CRISPR technology would not probably be appropriate for, this, for that particular type of um, uh, problem. I actually, if we learn more about uh, the disease and we understand its fundamental cause, there could, I imagine, in the future be some application of CRISPR technology, which what one would do would be to modify some cells and then put them back into the body, uh, presuming, of course, those are cells that one can do that with. Uh, but, but again, we don't know enough about the disease to know whether the CRISPR technology would actually be a way to uh, provide a treatment. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Hansen here on uh, related to, to the microbiome, uh, a question comes in here as can this shed light on the optimal diet, so diet modification, not, not probiotics proper, but can we modify the diets? Is your work um, telling us more about uh, dietary and nutritional aspects of this disease? I actually think the gut microbiome is probably not as relevant to that as the metabolomics studies that are that have been done. I think that with more work on metabolomics, we may be learning uh, the you know optimum uh, type yes. of, of fuel that people with MECFS uh, might need to have in order to deal with their metabolic deficiencies. Yes, thank you. And, and a follow-up on that, how can one uh, delineate um, better the results of these metabolomics in the context of 
different backgrounds of patients, uh, uh, the different comorbidities, um, cholesterol, uh, hyperlipidemia, all these metabolic diseases that alter our analytes uh, in general. Well, again, you know, what, like, like everything else, what's needed is, a, is large studies. Um, yes. CFS is, MACFS uh, research has suffered from the fact of lack of funding in small studies. If we had a lot more uh, patients and controls in our metabolomic studies, and we had also very good information on their symptoms and all and their cholesterol and all those other issues, uh, I think we would be able to look for correlations and find what is correlated, what is not correlated. So again, it's a question of if, if we can do a lot more patients and have a lot more information about those patients, then we are more likely to be able to figure out uh, what's going on. Yes, thank you. And, and Dr. Hansen, this is also a question related to statistics. Um, we, you know, our audience is diverse. We have scientists and we have non-scientists. Would you, would you be able to calibrate the, the listeners to what is a good sample size for these type of studies? In fact, this is a real question that just came in. Um, will there be a sufficient patient number uh, that, that for us to consider a study valid? Um, I don't consider either our study or the other study not valid. I think actually a thorough statistical analysis was done on both that allows us to make conclusions. Yes. But you you just you do want to um, uh, you know have it. You do every study needs to be repeated. We have to some extent uh, uh, validated some of the results in an independent study of the work in, uh, for the PNA, in the PNAS paper. Uh, but uh, clearly, just like the natural killer cell differences have now been seen in several different laboratories, it's always important to see these uh, uh, differences and findings in multiple laboratories. And really, the more the subjects, the better to uh, really uh, get down to the fine details of what's happening in the patients. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, Dr. Hansen. This is this has been a fascinating uh, overview of current and uh, future research of MECFS, not only uh, you know in, in your lab but uh, in the field in general. So thank you for doing this. This is truly fascinating. We promised our folks that we will stop uh, at the top of the hour, so we will we will conclude now. But uh, thank you for working with us on answering uh, the questions um, that remains. And I appreciate you uh, uh, giving this webinar today. And good luck in the, with the center. Uh, and all, all the best to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.